Well, I'm glad you said that now that we started recording because um, the uh, the fact that we just had lunch at a brand new restaurant here in downtown Columbus. Vertigo. And it was Vertigo. So um, what, what did you think of the experience? I mean, it did have a, a bit of – it was different. It, it was, was disorienting. A, it was, it was, <laughs> I felt some vertigo. Okay. I think uh, so it's aptly named. Well, Even though I asked the server initially – what is the significance? I found that out very quickly. Right. And the answer to that was? Well, first, if you think you're eating a certain kind of cuisine, it's a mashup. It's a fusion. A fusion. Fusion, that's right. That's the term that's, they that's use. That's the new term now. So um, that means a little bit of everything. A little bit of combined everything. Combined on, yeah. on whoever the chef or the restaurant owner decides will go together, that's what they put together. Well, they fused beets into my salad. Okay. Well, and and I thought I'd go with it because I hadn't had beets since I was a child, and I always thought I don't like beets. And I thought, how do I know? That's really? right. That sounds like that a was kid, by the forty five years say, ago. I don't like beets. Yeah, All right, I don't like them, but I yeah, I sort of dug them today, and they're very healthy. So my fusion had fused beets with uh, feta cheese. That was yes. different, and some hummus in there. I had thought. Yeah. hummus, pita, yeah, yeah. lettuce. And you had the I had the bowl. rice bowl um, with a, a lot of different vegetables in there, and uh, what turned out to be uh, some uh, hibachi steak, as opposed to the chicken that I ordered, which was a little bit different. But um, I was okay with it. New restaurant, okay. I'm not going to send it back because it looked good and it tasted good. So. More power to the Vertigo restaurant here in downtown Columbus. So here on Talk with Mike and Tom, TMT, on CMG, that's Columbus Media Group, Uptown Columbus, First Avenue, uh, we're talking about a subject, and you warned me to set up my microphone so that I did not pop my peas. That was very good. I like the way you uh, just um, went through that process and actually used the words. We're not, if we decide not to use any words that start with the letter P, um, we wouldn't have much of a conversation. We wouldn't have a conversation so at all. we've got to pop our peas. Well, maybe we got to pronounce the peas, but not pop the peas. Pronounce and be very mindful of the any P words. Well, I was watching this group play down at the loft down here in Columbus, Georgia, down on Broadway, and I noticed they had a jazz singer. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think you might have been there that night. But um, certainly, the last time I went, I noticed that the um, that the singer on stage with the microphone there, when she started to really get loud and belt out yeah. the sound, she would move back from the microphone very elegant and uh she was some more singer man yeah listen and she, uh was able to really control what came through the speakers for the audience and didn't blow out the audience because she was on the mic if she'd have really belted that out Fabulous. it would have uh, been a problem for all of us there on every level she was great technically great she had a great ear she was uh engaging and oh by the way yeah i had sat next to her before she performed right and i had no idea she was going to be performing right. she was just really relaxed and uh all um, about the party and then she got up and she did her thing yeah. leveled the place yeah i mean you can't do jazz singing much better than she did it. Yeah, she was she yeah. was she was great, and and that idea that I I don't know why I focused on the way she was pulling back and going forward to the microphone, showed her in total control of how that sound was going to be heard, which is unusual. Most people don't pay too much attention to a microphone. They usually stay at a static <laughs> distance and uh, maybe do some things um, and not be aware that they're coming across too hot or. Not strong enough. Well, we've heard heard a lot of bands that had first a bad PA to start with that was distorting and just loud and too many highs, and then the singer just trying to overcome a terrible PA right, 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 right. by not practicing safe singing. Safe singing, okay, right. and that's a yeah. new one for me. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you're right about that, and particularly when we're down here on Broadway, yep. and on a Friday night, and they've blocked off the streets, and we've got a band playing yep. live outside, yep. which is, uh, the acoustics are always going to be iffy, sketchy. Permanent somebody, echo. 
uh, too much of this, not enough of that, yep. and mm-hmm. it's not going to be mixed well. And so there's this overcompensation that happens sometimes with the singer. The mic's not loud enough, and they have to really belt it out. Uh, you know, it's 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 a wonder some of those concerts make it, but um, people st- tend to enjoy it. So more power to them. So. Well, I think it depends on how much of the uh, different kiosks you've participated or or sought the uh, libation from those. Anyway, yeah, if, that, you, okay, if, uh, you if you've been out there since four thirty buying beer, then right. uh, Every, by the time the the band starts at six, you're uh, you're ready for whatever. And if it sounds bad, well, it sounds good to you. Everybody sounds good now. That's right. Well, an interesting trip over there for lunch today. I have to say, the Vertigo Restaurant yeah. uh, on Twelfth. That's Twelfth, yeah, right? Uptown Columbus, Georgia. Yeah, mm-hmm. great. And down here, just good around stuff. the block uh, from. CMG Studios here yeah. where we're at today, and yeah. uh, we're about to start a podcast, it sounds like. Maybe well, we've already started. I'm well, we sure. were going to take on Stephen Pinker, the Canadian psychologist who works at Harvard. Yeah, so a uh, cognitive psychologist at Harvard, well-known, written a lot of books, has a very interesting <laughs> take on things, and uh, well, I guess we're going to go there. Well, I always right? think of Pinker as as one of the young uh, rising stars, but he he's not a kid. I mean, he's no. a year older than I am, and I'm certainly not a kid. I just turned sixty four, so now you know about Pinker. Oh, he's sixty five. All right, yeah. so there you go. Well, he has the hair of a forty five year old. Yeah, so he's, he has that's it going what, on. Uh, some people yeah. says he's got that, but a uh, very interesting guy. I, I'm I'm uh, quite interested in his. Uh, his books and his take on things, and when he, uh, I think the probably the most famous book was the uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, yeah, uh, which was a quote from Abraham Lincoln, I believe. That's what started us on Pinker, really. Although yeah. I'd read him on on, uh, and I can't remember the name of the book, but it's uh, about how a mind develops. I right. just saw the I just saw the book the other day. I thought I need to reread it, but. Uh, he makes some wonderful points. Yeah, I mean the the, the first uh, book we just mentioned. I mean that was really kind of a uh, a tipping point. Although I think that's a Gladwell book, so we'll come back to that <laughs> yeah, right, another right. point. But but uh, Pinker's book may have been uh, kind of a tipping point in that he brought out in the general. I'll generalize here, but basically that things have gotten better in our world despite the fact that we hear news that is terrible. And, yeah. of course, newscasts, are, that's their job, I suppose. Nobody's going to come on and say, hey, uh, we're broadcasting from this country where there hasn't been a war in the last 30 years and everybody's happy. That's not going to play on the news. We're going to go with the disasters, with the horrors. Uh, and what happens is that people believe that's the way the world is because yeah. they're getting inundated with with news like that, where Pinker's book was really a sort of a milestone in this this uh, turnaround and acceptance with statistics and figures that basically show that we are doing better. We're uh, we're having a better life than we ever had before. And there's a number of different chapters in that book, and even in the book that we'll talk about today, Enlightenment Now, his latest book, that there's a lot of evidence to say the world's gotten better. Well, and we need to figure out what to, how to interpret that and what to do with it. Well, and, and you know, it's funny. The, uh, the uh, Internet guy came to fix my Internet modem this morning. Okay. And he and I got in the discussion about public education. His right. father is a principal, and, of course, I did that work for years. Sure. And, uh, y- you know, there's a current or a conventional wisdom that public education is failing us, failing our children. Right. Right. Somehow something's not working. We're, we've put a lot of money into it. Uh, we've done a lot of changes. Uh, but uh, other countries are sort of beating us out on, on all the statistics about education for some reason. Well, I think, you know, a lot of that goes to what your assessment is and uh, what are you trying to assess. Uh, oftentimes those assessments don't assess the very things that make money for those of us in the U.S. One, creativity. Two, innovation. That's not 
that's not assessed by those assessments. But one of the statements yeah, he made to me, the, the reason we got in the discussion, he was in my home office working, and he saw that um, I was— uh, Oh, he, I'm sorry. Who is this? Uh, the Internet. Oh, the Internet The guy. Internet repair yeah, guy. I'm, yeah. ba- I'm back with you now. Thanks. Yeah, so he was he was in, in my home office uh, working in there, and he said— uh, uh, we got to the whole deal about me having been in education and, right. and done that. And he said, well, you, you know a lot about education with all that experience. And what I said to him was, really, education has changed so much mm-hmm. over the 15 years uh, when I was at Columbus State. Mm-hmm. And so it was more than 15 years ago where I was in public ed as far as K-12. And I said, what the – teachers and administrators are doing now is light years, just like in any field, light years removed. And I was sort of thinking of that framed up in this podcast because mm-hmm. uh, so many of the things that are done that that are being done in public education now, we just plain didn't do them back in those days. Or if we did, right. we took a stab at it. And I'll give you an example. Yeah. One of the issues we talked about was the idea of discipline and how we disciplined. And he said, well, when he was in school, he, they, they utilized corporal punishment, that kind right. of thing. Get the paddle from the principal. And I was, I was in public education when that concept sort of changed. And what it made us do was really rethink how we educated students on consequences and how things happen and what expected behavior was. Mm-hmm. And I think having some of the consequences we'd had earlier maybe made us lazy, or at least mm-hmm. lazy in the sense that we said, well, if it was good enough for me, it's good enough for you. Right. And, and it was a, a, a simple and a quick fix to a problem without much thought to it then. Yes, we, we have a problem, this is the discipline, and now we're out and going on about our business. And despite the tremendous horror stories that have taken place in some schools, and they have, you know, recently you have these uh, – uh, issues pop up with uh, with uh, violent behavior and that kind of thing. The actual statistics show that public schools are so much safer than they were maybe even uh, than 10, 15 years ago. And one of the things that uh, occurs to me is that when I was in school as a kid, sure, we fought at recess all the time. It was just part of recess. Well, by the time I was at the end of my career as a as a middle school principal, hmm. when we had a fight on campus, it was a very unusual, disruptive kind of thing. Okay. And we were hypersensitive to it. So in that sense, some of the things that Pinker is going to say in this book, Enlightenment Now, mm-hmm. are it kind of has that kind of wisdom. In other words, you go to the data. And the data show that, well, the things we think about a lot of times may not really be occurring. Right. Well, we're almost um, we're given this information through um, where our newspapers, our media, our television, and of course now we're getting media uh, through our uh, social media, our devices that right. we carry with. Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody yeah. has a smartphone. You're getting information there, uh, information and in what's going on in the world's ar- around you at all times. It's hard to get off the grid, as some people have talked about. So there is there's that particular level of uh, complexity, I guess, that we have to, to deal with that we're all in the know, whereas before we were not so much. Yep. And we're kind of focused on our own little world now we're connected across the board in so many ways and you have things to sort of reflect on that your behavior may not be accepted in another situation and now you're having to measure all of that and what are the rules and uh, so we were fed a, a lot of information along the way but now it's an explosion in a way that we have to really kind of work with and figure out what's going on it's sort of the ver- vertigo idea in other words yeah. that uh yeah. that you have so much data you you're really disoriented it's hard to it's hard to get your get your bearings you and know and you that. know i i think one of the issues there is just that management of that um 
that universe of data that's at you every day from your waking moment when you pick up your phone or turn on the television or whatever, read the paper, whatever that uh, routine is for you, that we just uh, not, I'm not sure that we need to, that we haven't figured out a way to sort it out. Is it, um, uh, you know, we've had a show on other podcasts about confirmation bias. Do we hear what we want to hear that fits with our beliefs? And that's acceptable to us, and other things are not acceptable to us. So um, there's, that's just one in, in many kinds of uh, issues that we have to resolve because there's so much information, and it's not always what we believe. So we're getting different information. I think that's at the basis of where Pinker has been going. Uh, he's saying in certain ways, I paraphrase, but maybe I'm making this up myself, that um, you're not accurate on what you thought. Here's some data that shows that you're not, you're wrong, basically. Yeah. And that there's another way to look at it. I'm not, that's a disruptive effect I think this is having on us as well. Well, I think the, the push for him is the whole idea that, that, uh, we can uh, indulge in better living through science right, that uh, right, yeah. tech technology has the answer those kinds of things mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. that most of the progress humankind has made and a lot of it since the 1800s in other words right. if you look at trace the arc in so many areas safety uh poverty uh substance well, food riches etc yeah for going back to uh, uh really a, at the beginning uh, uh one, zero one ad if you look at the arc <laughs> of of improvement f- all the way up until the eight certainly the 1700s and in most cases the 1800s you don't see much of an arc and then suddenly the arc is is extreme and then in the midway through the 20th century it's it is exponential right. almost straight up the right, curve exactly yeah. so in other words you see these things like life expectancy in uh, just a few years doubles and yeah. that's worldwide that's not right, just right, in right, in right. Uh, what we th- tend to think of as uh, as uh, uh, industrial nations you know the the G7 type nations sure. you know or whatever they're calling it now you know uh, yeah, and I think the lifespan, you mentioned that as well, that, that uh, just not that long ago, it was 30, 30 years. That's People right. People were living to the ripe old age of 30, um, and now we're pushing 80, 90, and more in lots of ways. So, uh, yeah, there's some evidence. And I think, you know, coming across this evidence, reading it, and trying to, you know, make sense out of it does cause a bit of disruption to the way that you think it's first of all wait that's not what i thought it was so i'm going to push back on that yeah and then as you begin to think about it hey wait a minute there's so much evidence to say that this is correct um maybe i need to change my tune on this well at the same time he takes to task what he calls the progressophobes in other words right. the those who fear progress because it will it will create unanticipated consequences that will ultra, ultimately destroy humankind. Here's a good example: the <laughs> the whole idea of uh, of industrialization mm-hmm. and, and uh, uh, how, especially in terms of carbon footprint, the whole idea that those things right. that have really lessened poverty, and this isn't just in a few countries; it is now globally. In fact, countries are more like likely to be prosperous than to be poverty stricken. Right. Whereas, if you look back in the United States at around the turn of the century, the the percentage of people who had any prosperity at all was very small. Now, globally, that percentage is has increased vastly, and it continues to be in, increasing. However, okay. At the same time, you have this issue with a tremendous carbon footprint, and that seems to be increasing and creating climate change and that kind of thing. And that's something that's that's an issue out there that that really needs to be given some thought and actually some action. So, but he but he says that the answers there are like very similar to the answers to uh, 
lack of longevity, which and that those answers lie in science and technology. In other words, the Enlightenment. Yeah, which um, evidently started uh, the first paper. I think I read in one of the chapters that was 1785, the yeah. the, the uh, topic about enlightenment in the 1700s. So, yeah, I think also there's just this um, this claim in the book about the a pushback. Uh, particularly in things like ideologies and political and even religion, that there's a there's a idea of belonging to a group and believing the the sort of the credos, the the different um, uh, guidelines that you should believe if you're in a particular group, and that keeps you from accepting some of the things about progress and so forth. So you may disagree with some because of the group that you're in. At the same time, I I sort of read that with a little bit of amusement, and and I'm always amused. I I love to read Pinker. I think he's a wonderful writer, but I'm always amused at his writing because at the same time, his his point, I think, is, well, if you have these dogmatic religions or quasi-religions or ideologies that prevent you from buying into the whole Enlightenment thing, then you're really you're really working against humankind. Mm. And at the same time, I'm thinking, yeah, but uh, hey, bro, you have uh, your belief in science, technology, and the Enlightenment. And as I look at it, it sort of reads like, I hate to say it, a religion. So, yeah. you know, there's an irony there. Be careful Although, where you point the finger. There may be more <laughs> pointing back at you, as they say. Uh, but that's not to say that he that those points are are off base. But right. but he he also has an ideological approach, and it's the the uh, the total belief in uh, the can do science will solve all issues and boy, but he's got a lot of data to back it up. Yeah. I, f- I found it interesting that, um, it was about being rational a lot, uh, yeah. in several chapters, they talked about just rational thinking can help you through the problem. Yeah. What is your best option in this moment? Uh, and also taking that onto a grander scheme for some of the problems we have worldwide, but yeah, you you can solve things in that way, and certain political beliefs may interfere with that. Yeah. So I mean, he made the early on. I think he he made the push for more education, better education. What'd you think about that idea of what how he was talking about you in a way? Uh, you're just not educated enough if you can't use ration, or rational thinking and and uh, uh, and figuring out problems. It's, it's sort of threw a rock there at education as we know it. Well, it goes back to the discussion I was having with our our contractor this morning, the the internet contractor, and the the idea that what really has a tremendous effect on what students do as far as behavior at school. Right. is by educating them. And the the longer I was in it, the more I came to believe this. It, it's almost counterintuitive. But I really strongly believe that the more you showed students what an outcome would be from a behavior that wasn't desirable, the more a, a student would say, you know, I, I just think I, I need to do better. And you would see a, a drop in, say, undesirable behaviors, fighting, sure. uh, disruption of class, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. there are other things that feed into that too, but just the fact that you sit down and discuss with with uh, a student what the outcomes of his or her behavior is going to be uh, has a an incalculable effect on that behavior. It's almost like it's almost like I log my food every day into a food app. Uh, into a food diary. Okay. And I never made any kind of decision to really change my diet. Right. I never said, I'm going to eat this, not eat that. Right. But when I started logging things in, the choice I made was often, do I want meat on this salad today? No. I I don't feel like I need it. Now, you know, if I've right. worked out really hard, maybe I need the protein. But today, so... I could have said, I'm going vegan. I never did that. Right, but just the awareness. The, yeah, you were letting the data sort of, you know, 
through osmosis or some way uh, that we don't know of. But anyway, you were exposed to that data, and it helped you make the decision in the moment, even though you weren't tracking it or like Pinker makes a chart uh, of everything there. You do have an app, and you're using that uh, to be more informed about your decision-making. And then once you have that awareness, you're constantly asking the question, do I really need this bag of chips, for instance. Right. Now, at the, uh, in uh, f- fairness, I have to have full disclosure and say there's right. some days where I just hide from that app. So okay. I don't okay. even want to know. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think that's like everybody. But but the whole yeah. idea of, of education, yeah, I think clearly that's uh, – So is it is it true to say that uh, the more educated you are, maybe the better decisions you're going to make, or is that going too far? I th- well, I think it depends on what kind of education it is, and I think it. I, I certainly think being educated as far as how to innovate, how to solve problems, how to find information, that's really important. If it's education that indoctrinates you, well, all that does is create a filter that everything's filtered through, and you're unwilling to to look at data because if it if the, or even if you do look at data. If the data doesn't fit what's in your filter, right. then you don't confirmation it's, bias, it's, as we talked about on another show. And that that idea is that if it, it's uncomfortable, if it doesn't fit into what you believe, and I think that's the uh, that may be the moment where you have to ask yourself some serious questions about when something is confronted what you've always believed. Because let's face it. Sort of believing in some ideology or political kind of thing, whatever that is, is a comfort. Uh, you're with a group. You're all agreeing. And, boy, that's a nice comfort in that. And uh, who wants to give that up to be the outlier? One more book. Um, I think that's a Gladwell book again, too. So we're out there um, outside of the group. And you're kind of alone at that point. And so you've got to do some reconciling with this. Do I remain a part of the group or am I on the periphery? Where do I go? What am I doing now when that happens? And uh, I, I think we're kind of going, I think we tend to, somebody had the statistical term uh, that means regression to the mean, that this notion is that we fall back yeah. to what we're comfortable with yeah. and we're right there in that 50 percentile. Um, right. So, um, But I'm not sure. I don't. It, it, again, it's disruptive to a certain extent, but I think that's kind of a part of education, is it not? Yeah, well, and, and, and the, other, the, the other aspect that, that kind of comes to mind is just because I don't believe something doesn't make it fake news. In other words, I don't believe what you're saying, so what you're saying is fake news. Well, if that's the case, then I'm always uh, looking at things through a through a prism, through through my own filter, a filter of my own devising, or of uh, or that's been created for me by my environment or my upbringing, and I'm not mm-hmm. really taking a a a wide enough view in order to get all the data I need to solve problems. Yeah, so. I think I, I think that's that's part of it. This this notion of being exposed to uh, new ways of thinking, or in this case, the data uh, that is that is um, telling us what we believed before is no longer. Uh, the way to look at it, we're living longer, there's more food out there, there's uh, more technology, everything is getting better on that on a broad level. Um, it's something we have to grapple with. On the other hand, we're also in communities. I mean, some of this book was really talking about this in a global, in a national yep. way, in a global way. That's right. But does it affect the your locale, your 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 small community, even your small family, in some ways, that uh, that it may not uh, fit into as easily as he's making uh, that it should. When people answer surveys and they answer about their own situation, yeah. their own prosperity, their own community, their own safety, right? They tend to be very optimistic when they answer about safety or prosperity or any of a number of issues in terms of everyone 
they tend to be very negative. And that that is something that holds true over and over again. And yeah, yeah, when we absolutely. first when we first uh, noticed it, we noticed it in education where a survey would say uh, rate education on a on a scale, you know, and people would or education in the US on a scale. Right. They'd really downrate it, sure. right? Sure anyway. At on the same survey you'd say, but rate your education at your community school and invariably and it held true across all schools across uh every uh, every kind of socioeconomic group i think invariably, I know where you're going if it's my school yeah well my school pretty doggone good miss miss jones is the greatest <laughs> teacher I, we love our principal they're a, they keep real good order but discipline in all the other schools has gone to hell so that tends to be it when 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 you look at surveys i you know and i've done a lot of surveys right. uh, you really got a question a whole lot of things for instance how did you ask the question to whom did you ask the question how was it framed up and if you don't have anything like that to sort of uh cut both sides to see where people are coming from so it can't be true that everybody's school is good, but, <laughs> but everybody's yours. school is also bad, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, I got to say something about surveys. You know, it's um, and and what we we learned in I taught a research course uh, at one point in uh, in the programs there in our graduate programs. Uh, the idea that a uh, self survey or a self report turns out it's the least reliable, least valid form of information. Sorry, it just doesn't hold up. And so what happens in these surveys sometimes, I think we have they do a plus or minus uh, yeah. kind of notion. If you see it on TV, you see that a lot. Well, that's just not enough because what, what's <laughs> happening is this is at best a correlation with other mm -hmm. ideas. It's never uh, something that you can uh, use from an experimental point of view, which is the opposite of that or further – valid and reliable ways to get it, gather information where you have a control group and right. you can make comparisons That's and right. then you can attribute cause don't mean to get in a research lesson here but but the idea of asking my uh, me about how good a driver I am and how good a, how bad a driver everyone else is I got news for you I'm pretty good and they're not so um, right. And uh, that's true across the board, and that's that confirmation bias uh, and various types of bias that we have in our thinking. And who's to say uh, who's objective and who has the absolute right answer in this? And I think there's just a lot of question marks about uh, uh, surveys and how people think, and everybody thinks everybody else is bad and we're good. So it made your point very well, I think, in this in this conversation. Sort of goes with what George Carlin always said about driving. Anybody that drives slower than you is an idiot. Anybody who drives faster than you is a maniac, right? <laughs> so that's a sort of a self-report. That that your framework great. is self-reported, you know. Anytime we can throw Carlin in here for a joke, I'm, I'm good for that. So, uh, so one thing that uh, Pinker talked, or two things that Pinker talked about, and I, and I sort of want to explore these because I think uh, as people who aspire to to move forward, to move humankind forward, to make us safer, to make us more prosperous, to make us healthier, those kinds of things. Uh, the, the twin issues of nuclear proliferation, and this sounds like I'm coming at this from a 60s standpoint, especially I'm going to go to the two things, the nuclear proliferation in, other, in terms of weapons, and then the other other. A uh, big issue is the whole issue of climate change and where we are now in terms of uh, uh, the fact that uh, at least the general perception now is that, yeah, there's so much carbon in the atmosphere that it's, that it's contributing to climate change, and these things need to be uh, addressed in a, in a very positive way. So, uh, you know, you, you think about... Uh, Pinker and Pinker's approach uh, would be first to look at climate change and to say that, yeah, uh, there's been a, a marked move on as far as policy to, to uh, work to lessen the carbon 
footprint, but at the same time, it's still increasing and increasing at a rate uh, globally to where uh, uh, there's go- going to be some rather serious issues in the next 20, 30 years that that are that impact us. And in fact, many scientists are saying those impact us now. So I, I think you're right about that. Uh, we're not. But 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 it's interesting that the rate of all of this information is exponential. We had Dr. Abraham George in here not long ago talking about the acceleration of all of this information and the technology that's moving with um, the virtual reality, with the augmented reality, yeah. and and uh, artificial intelligence. Anyway, that's that's moving. That's going to outpace our ability to really make sense of where what we have in the moment, much less what we're having down uh, weeks and months and years uh, uh, to come. So I think it's a real problem. So that becomes even more critical as as we're sifting through all that data to to ascertain what kinds of policies need to be developed. And, and they can't just be developed in one or two countries. In other words, the U.S. policies have – toward uh, reducing carbon footprint have been very aggressive to to do things that address this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Other countries are moving in that direction, some countries faster than others. Uh, Pinker's assertion would be that one of the problems, and particularly in the area of climate change, is that the things we do to address this really won't have as much effect as the one or two big things we need to do. For instance, right. Right. Uh, if his point on carbon footprint, and, and there's a lot of disagreement on this, but his point is if companies have to pay in terms of taxes or fees right. or a carbon fines, tax, in a words. carbon yes. tax, uh-huh. and that gets uh, relayed, obviously would be relayed onto the consumer, that suddenly that would change things. And that's a role government could take, even though it would be an unpopular position, it would be a very leaderly position. But he says in order to to really address things in a a very large sort of way, you have to make pop, uh, policy decisions that may be unpopular in the short term. And uh, that, by the way, that revenue generated by governments could be defrayed to finding other ways, other alternate forms of energy and that right. kind of thing. Right, important. So his other, uh, his, uh, the other point he made about climate change is there is a tremendous fear about using nuclear energy. Oh, yeah, very much so, yeah. And yet yeah, he says yeah. when you go to the data, it's some of the safest energy we have. Coal is absolutely one of the worst. It just the act of pulling it out of the earth is so unsafe for the workers and has killed so many people. So when you look at it long term, but there is a if if it has nuke attached to it, right. then it's it sort of stirs We're that suddenly progress- back in the fifties. <laughs> yeah, it stirs <laughs> that progressive so. foe. And, and you know the other the other issue and and uh, the other issue that he raised that's a a real genuine specter on the world stage is the uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons. Right. And that would take equally an aggressive point uh, perspective. In other words, that the the people who own the most nuclear weapons, notably Russia and the United States, and to a lesser extent China, would have to agree in a world where other people are developing nuclear weapons to lessen their ar- arsenals. Right. So that and and to let and to uh, commit to no first strike. You know, the United States has never committed to no first strike. In other words, right. it could be that you would attack a uh, an ally, and all options are on the table. That's what we say as a nation, and have traditionally said. Well, when you say that, other people who have nuclear weapons are like, well, you know. Uh, I don't want them to launch their nukes and take out our nukes, and then we lose the war. And and right. and so what that does is it exacerbates a spiral. So 
uh, it's it's ironic that 20 years ago we had these discussions, and the ones having the discussions were uh, uh, Premier Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan, and actually started moving us in what is a very progressive and liberal direction. But now we seem to have forgotten that. Well, I think that is a very interesting point um, because right now it does seem like things are sort of upside down in a lot of ways. Uh, some of us would agree uh, that our this point in time in yeah. the political world and the government and so yeah. forth – you know, I remember not long ago uh, reading Thomas Friedman's book about a flat earth and um, right. th- uh, not not in the conspiracy theory idea, <laughs> right. but but the idea that we were all connected, yeah. that, that we were all one family on this blue ball out in space here, and that we had to work together as across countries. Countries had to come together on that. Well, we've taken the opposite tack right now, it seems like, the, yep. the tribalism and the nationalism and so forth, uh, which which I find is counterproductive in a lot of these things that Pinker's talking about. But going back to something um, y- you uh, you said a, uh, said a moment ago about the idea that uh, – to make change on an individual level or at a small level doesn't uh, affect this um, eco problem, this climate problem that we have. That the big corporations, the governments, have to do some work in that. In that, yeah. uh, whether it's a carbon tax on the individual and, yep. and or the, on the companies and the, taking more responsibilities for that, it's almost as if this is a tug of war uh, with these ideas that there is some ways that we have to make the planet better so that people can live on it, our children, our grandchildren, yeah. future generations, whereas um, we've got people taking the opposite tack with that. Uh, there's nothing to worry about. So it, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of working through, and this is a pivotal point now, I yeah. think, um, that uh, we, we've gotten ourselves to to make some decisions about some of these bigger issues. And then this, another thing that you had mentioned, just brought up a second ago, I'm sorry, I'm recounting some of this because it, it, it seemed to me to be important, that um, in the the idea of uh, nuclear uh, power yeah. is safer yeah. uh, than we thought, but we associate it with these nuclear yeah. weapons and so forth, which right. is a very dangerous and uh, uh, civilization-killing kinds of issues. And another issue we ha- we have to address, and we have to address that. Yeah. And you know, in the news, and I, uh, this will uh, hope I don't know if it makes my point, but the idea that there's a particular country out there that's in the news that stated in the last couple of days they want a nuclear weapon. Mm-hmm. And these are not people we can probably trust very much. Right. So all of these kinds of concerns, which I think, uh, I guess my point is that I thought we had these things under control and we were moving uh, in a progressive way, if you yep. in quotes. New world order. Uh, that we were, The we 90s. Were, we were working through yeah. these. Mm-hmm. Well, we're not. We're right. we're right there facing these issues probably more so than we ever have before. And there's a lot of resistance for cleaning up the the world uh cleaning up our climate taking care of people doing all these things that just I, i'm not sure i understand why that uh there's so much opposition and resistance to these ideas that seem to make sense but i don't know you know it it's interesting i i uh sort of came from a background that tended to have a uh, just my family tended to have a lot of conservative views, and and uh, as a school administrator, I tended to have some uh, uh, conservative views. But the older I get, and the longer I'm around, and the more I observe human behavior, the more I feel that uh, yeah, there are some big issues that are critical issues. If you just look at data, and you just look at potential for catastrophe that there are some issues that need to be addressed and they need to be addressed immediately. And it's sort of counterintuitive. In other words, that uh, uh, it's similar to the uh, how important is education? Well, it's extremely important. Yes. Well, how important is cooperation and collaboration? Well, it's critically important. So when we do things like, uh, say, the United Nations is ineffective, what's well, only as if effective as – as we allow it to be, as right. as a uh, across the globe, and that those kinds of things take leadership, but they also take. And I think 
Pinker's point would be this, that the answers are out there, but we have to be honest about what the challenges are. In other words, we need to lay the challenges on the table and then say, okay, what are some ways we can address these challenges in ways that still honor everybody? There's also a, a point of view that says that, well, human beings are basically uh, self-serving and that right. if you belong to a certain group, that you are out to destroy the other group. Right. I think right. if if you were to look at data and really be honestly look at data, the majority of people just want to raise their families and be prosperous. That's, yes, so yes. How, how do we get to that? And, and, you know, those are huge, huge challenges. But at the same time, uh, huge challenges bring about huge leaders. And for us to be, as you said, engaged in sort of a global nationalistic approach and everybody's looking out for number one, nobody's really looking out for number one because th- that path leads to leads to just allowing the problems to fester and get worse until suddenly uh you know uh there would be an immediate need to address it but then would it be a little on the late side i i, I think about and somebody else said this this went in the pinker book but uh we we face a lot of things that are similar to what if an asteroid was headed toward earth All right if an asteroid were headed toward Earth, I think the debate between, well, it's not really headed toward Earth. Yeah, it is headed toward Earth. You're an idiot. That that, that kind of debate. <laughs> uh, or uh, one country saying, well, that's the problem of the U.S. And the U.S. saying, well, that's Canada's problem. Canada saying that's Russia's problem. Well, what would ultimately happen in human nature being what it is, everyone would get together and hold hands and try to figure out a technical, logical way of addressing it and pull their resources. Yes, it ta- it would take that catastrophic event of civilization uh, coming to an end or to avoid this thing. Or uh, I guess we have to call Bruce Willis and uh, get some of those guys up there to plant a nuclear weapon on it. Sorry, that's a movie reference. But it's it's real interesting that we find ourselves in this world now where all this media is out there half of it's making we're trying to make sense out of it because it doesn't make sense we're wondering if it's a fact are there different art of alternative facts really i i mean i I find i find that uh kind of difficult to to comprehend but there there's so much conspiracy stuff out there with these ideologies that people are following politics particularly where um you you just automatically doubt what's right in front of you. At some point, a fact is actually true. It's not a belief about a fact. It's not, I believe this fact to be this way. No, it's a fact, whether you believe it or not, is actually true. And I think sometimes um, we, we're bombarded in this social media and the news and everything now um, with information that, tends to make us doubt. Who do we believe? Who are leaders that we truly believe are doing the right thing? And as soon as you go, yes, this is the person I can believe in, somebody else says, well, not that guy or not that person. The, so uh, that's a real confusing piece, and, and I think it's sign of the times, really, where we're at. Well, the first thing is I, I think one of the worst things that could have happened in American politics, and this is going to really sound off the wall, but just I'm going to track it, was the whole idea that we develop talking points. I I think when you're unwilling as a leader to answer questions because you have a set of talking points on your desk that go with the ideology of the group that you belong to. Yes, and you have to adhere to that. Then, then what you end up doing is stop answering. You, you, you stop answering bona fide questions from people who are just concerned. So when I see town hall meetings, and so often I see uh, when it's not a planted question, when it's a genuine, right, right. Uh, uh, genuine electrician from Columbus, Georgia, who raises his or her hand at a uh, at a forum and asks a question, what what are we going to do? It looks to me like that climate change is being impact is being 
exacerbated by how we, how we process manufacturing? And the answer is either, well, that's that dumb party that's in power that creates the policies that make that happen, or the other answer is that's not happening, that's fake news. Well, neither of those is an answer to a genuine yeah. question from a parent who just wants to see their children yeah. have a world to grow up in. And that's the first thing. Yeah, that's we, a problem because I think we're beginning to accept those dodges and that uh, what what the points are. And I will just stick to what I was going to say. Never interact in the moment. Be in the moment with the person and, and give a authentic and genuine right. response. That's out the door now. What's wrong with that? I'd like to see that come back. Well, I think it, yeah, it's. I, I think it's a lot about power, and and you know, politics has always been a power a, money. It, it's always been money. a rough and tumble endeavor and all that. But to, but to cover everything over with the idea that well, politics are that the the whole politic is just tough, and uh, you just have to fend for yourself out there. I think let's leaders off the hook a little bit and i think leaders uh and it's funny i've been in leadership now i'm uh, a retired guy but i've been in leadership roles my whole career and you know one of the things i i I thought of is is ultimately what guides you as a leader and it's to look out for the interests of the people who who report to you whether they believe what you believe or not right uh, to look out for the people in your care, whether they are, uh, you know, uh, believe your particular ideology or not. And if you don't do that, then you're really failing as a leader. And I, uh, so I would I would add to Pinker's points, and a lot of them are okay. are really good. The whole idea of science, technology. Yeah, I think the answers are out there. Sure. But the first thing we have to define the issues, and and somehow we need to understand that if you're a Republican, that the folks who are your brother or sister who's a Democrat just wants the same things for their children that you want. And if you are you live in the U.S., you have to understand that the majority of people in the world, that's all they want. Now, yeah, our leaders— uh, engaged in game theory and have the, their arms stacked, and are they making bad decisions? Well, I think ultimately there has to be an effort toward that, and to always come up with uh, "I'm going to play hardball with you." First, it doesn't make for good negotiation, and second, uh, current negotiation theory talks a lot about not just win-win, but how can we. In a negotiation, and I'm talking about a, a, a sales type negotiation or sure. a union type negotiation. How can I find out what your needs are, and what my needs are, and how can we find a new way of addressing those? I think uh, just to say we're going to compromise and have a win win, I think that's a, a 1980s technology. I just think in a new millennium we can do better. Well, I think you. I think you're right about that, and I'm hopeful. I'm the uh, uh, eternal optimist in Me so too. many ways, um, and I get. Uh uh, it, it, it's getting whittled away at a little bit every day. It seems like I was kind of curious too about the idea of corruption. He didn't have a chart on that. Mm-hmm, he didn't no. have a chapter on corruption. Right. Is corruption uh, like the rest of his charts, kind of going up? Are we seeing more corruption? People taking advantage of other people, taking advantage of the situation, trying to make money as a goal. Um, he certainly talked about the haves and have-nots uh, in this book as well. But on the idea of corruption, it sounds like it's getting better. Now, I need a chart from him to tell me that it's not because I'm beginning to wonder uh, all the conspiracy theories, the counter arguments for everything that comes out that you once thought was a sure fact. Now it's questionable. The earth is flat or is it round? I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, we've got those people on the extremes that are making these points and, and sure, it's easy to dismiss those, but then you've got the ones where you're not knowledgeable about and you kind of question it. And then the corrupt person may take advantage of that. If I'm out to get something over everyone else, uh, regardless, 
uh, that makes for a very nasty scenario. And I'm kind of wondering about whether we are leveling out at uh, corruption, going up, or is, is getting uh, less and less. I'd like to see that chart. Well, it's hard to say. The researcher in me wants to react this way. Yeah. That there's a curve in human behavior, in yeah, any kind of behavior, in any kind of uh, social or scientific right. construct. There's a curve. And that on that curve, you're going to have everything from one end of the curve where where folks are saints. Right. And you're going to have the other end of the curve where folks are nothing but sinners. And you're going to have the middle part of the curve, people fall somewhere in the the one standard deviation or another, pos, right. plus or minus the, the mean, right? That's just right. – that's just – and if you if you ever actually have the data on anything and plot it, unless you're treating it some way, that's what you're going to have. So my guess is that, yeah, there are those people out there who are just stone corrupt, sociopaths, terrible, out to get theirs without getting is without there, you. Is there more of those now? Or see, uh, let's see, I need that I need that graph. See, I think I, I think probably you, you know my thought is that the majority of organizations find that if they engage in that behavior for too long, they die. <laughs> they they there's die a, because there's a consequence there's some, for that. And I love it when there is because they shouldn't get away with it. This is it's criminal kind of behavior, and we're accepting it as the norm. Uh, and maybe I'm going too far with that, but yes, I'm hopeful that. It won't go in that direction. Well, we're going we're going to see, for instance, a big ch- and and I'm not I'm not ripping on pharmaceutical firms as being evil or bad, but there have been practices in place. Sure, the firms have a part of that. The medical field has a part of that, and policymakers and government have a part that has contributed. Looks like to a tremendous opioid crisis. Absolutely. But and I they're think, in courts now having to pay back some money for that and, as and, we speak. And that's going to be very painful. Folks are going to lose positions. Folks are going to lose money. Governments are going to be changed over that. But ultimately, I think most folks, if they had the choice going in, would have tried to foresee this. And And I don't think many folks would have said, well... You know, I just don't care. You know, we're going to have a lot of addicts and a lot of people die. So what? I, I think probably it was more uh, delusion, uh, maybe not enough information, had never seen that, new drugs, those kinds of things. It, it's a very complex issue. So, again, was that uh, a result of corruption? Well, you know, we had a time where we had commercials that said, uh, these are the cigarettes that the doctors smoke, <laughs> you know. So I don't think at the same time, <laughs> true. I don't think true. the intent was to kill people. I mean, I don't think right. that no, was— No, no, it's to make a profit and uh, they get right. rich, basically, because this is a land of opportunity. And one way you do it, you kind of push the envelope a little bit. And if yep. few people get hurt along the way, and, you, know, you still make a good profit and you can pay those folks off or something. Yeah, that's a corruption idea, and I'm really wondering. Here's another idea idea that we haven't talked about, and I don't think it was that much in the book, but uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of my background a little bit with this. And I I find that, you know, I'm really, I think there's an overlay of this mental health with all these ideas that he's he's floated out there, particularly around the the rational um, uh, humanistic and and other uh, ideas that pushed along with, with science and so forth. That that really, what what's what does that look like? The mental health diagnoses of people and the narcissism that we have been seeing and people are talking about in our politics, the the um, sort of the ego unrestrained uh, notion, and and also depression and anxiety that people are having during these times of upheaval and and there's there's not a calming effect i've i've said that to to friends i probably said it to you at, at some point that i believe that there's sort of this uh 
I mentioned dysthymia, which is a low grade depression yeah. that's that's over. But I think it's also anxiety as yeah. well in there. I, I really think that there's there's something that's like a cloud at, at this point and. Uh, where are we seeing just the happy folks who seem to be mentally uh, stable and having great families and everything? That's probably true. It's probably out there. But I am thinking that somehow mental health needs to be in one of these chapters from Pinker where he, he's saying, hey, are we better off mentally? Is inferred in his writings, particularly along the ideas of education and so forth. But I'm kind of wondering about how well are we dealing at an individual level of, of managing this huge amount of data, this contradictory data, alternative facts, all of the things that we've sort of mentioned along the way today. That's one of my concerns. And then what do we do about that? And uh, do we have sort of the resources to manage that as we're moving forward? I'm not so sure, but I'm hopeful again that, uh, you know, I believe folks are basically good. And, yeah. and I want to believe that. Yeah. And I, I don't think I think we've got the uh, outliers and the people out there that are they're sort of in the news and pushing things in a, in a certain way for us to believe that it's more widespread corruption than it is uh, or mental illness. In some cases, you know, if you talk about crime and corruption, you have and substance abuse, you always have to add the mental health factor. Uh, in there as well. It just wasn't covered enough. I'd like to see him do a lot more with it because I think there's a lot more information that we should know. Well, and and to your point, uh, all you have to do is walk down the city streets oh, that's and right. see the that's vast right. increase of people living on the street. And now that's something that as a society we sort of grudgingly seem to accept right. or, or turn our eyes away from and that kind of thing. But right. uh, Clearly, the mental health approaches haven't been working over the last, really, going back to the early 70s. Uh, and, you know, there are historical reasons for that, it's, uh, sure. you know, but at the same time, uh, there are historical reasons for that doesn't get us off the hook of in terms of addressing it, does it? No, no, it doesn't. And I think a number of uh, big, I mean, you go to any big city now, there's uh, yeah. Los Angeles has this tent city. It yeah. takes up blocks and blocks yep. where people are living on the streets. Um, got, it continues to get worse. There's not a lot of good answers for that. You can build housing yep. as they've done in, in certain uh, Western cities and so forth, but that doesn't get the people into those and living the, the life that, um, Maybe they could have. So it's a giant question from my perspective, and I think we need more information to sort of figure out. Um, because you know, taking back and your your idea of education, there was a there was a big push uh, a while back for data driven decision making. Right. That was a, those were the keywords. Right. Uh, sort of the buzzwords uh, in education, probably in other places as well. Yep. Maybe even in government in some ways. But we need the we need that data. We need the information in order to make a decision. I think that's where it fits. And then we've got to have lawmakers and people in government uh, and the support of the general population to say this is an important issue. This is something we need. We'll all be better off if we tackle it and come out with a good solution for it. I don't think we're there with this tribalism and nationalism and other things that are going on right now. Well, here's the other thing. The solutions are hard work. Yes, they are. Uh, teaching children is a job that requires a tremendous amount of commitment and dedication and energy. Uh, addressing the homeless situation it requires that same kind of commitment and tremendous amount of energy. And, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes people may be a little afraid of those kinds of commitments at the same time. Growing crops in a drought requires a tremendous amount of commitment and energy. So, you know, we take for granted that, well, uh, yeah, we're whoever's doing the work of farming is just going to have to suck it up and uh, have insurance to deal with the drought and come back strong. Than that. Well, you know what? Uh, I, I get that that's, if we're not successful there, we don't eat. But at the same time, 
if we're not successful with uh, educating our, our young, then we don't have a strong economy. And if we're not successful in addressing mental health in a homeless situation, then who are we really as human that's, beings? Yes, that's so, a great question. Who are we and yeah. what do we want? And how do we flourish in life? What is this? I mean, it, it, it's almost one of those uh, basic questions, and I think he, he sort of addressed this at the beginning of the book, uh, but I, I've heard others talk about this idea of really um, it's an existential question. What are we here for? What do yep. we do with our life and so forth? You know, he he mentioned at one point the goal of maximizing human flourishing, uh, life, health, happiness, yep. freedom, knowledge, love, r- and the richness of experience. Yep. So we've got this life to live, and we sh- probably should do a better job uh, thinking about how we want it to be and then acting on that and moving in that direction. Um, that Those are kind of tough questions for a lot of people who are just day-to-day. We're trying to figure out... You know how to how to pay the bills and how to move to the next thing and and uh, uh, but but I think that those are the big questions like that and the ones you mentioned about mental health and and homelessness and and the problem with that and and coming up with a solution coming up with a uh, a, a, a plan to deal with that so that all people can flourish and have a great life experience. Why not look at the trends that he's got in his book? Everything's getting better, yeah, so to speak. In quotes, but uh, yeah, why aren't more people enjoying it? And why are we sort of stuck in some misery somewhere? Big questions. All, all I can, my only response has to do with me personally. And uh, this is a, sort of a bellwether month and year for me for a lot of reasons. Yeah. But you had uh, asked me, I had mentioned to you earlier that I had been on a retreat. It was sort of a yeah. personally self-imposed retreat. I didn't go anywhere. I just hung around the house, did I, some I, reading. I really, when you said retreat in your text, and I, I really thought, wow, he's he's with a group up uh, by, on a mountain. Up in the Rockies, uh, and, yeah. And, and you're doing these kind of things. But... It's even better than that. This was a retreat you took for yourself, and I think that's yeah. a great idea. And I just wanted to reflect on some things. And one of one of the outcomes of that, I, I, I sort of looked back at my life and looked forward to, and and I I found that the times when I felt the most alive and the times that I was the most effective were not the times when I was about me myself. They were the times when I was about a mission or about uh, I was about Columbus State University or I was about the Phoenix City Schools or I was about the Alexander City Schools or I was about my family. Those times when I was about me and what did I get and what was going to be meaningful to me, I, I, I found that I just sort of lost my way. So that's a gut check. And, yes. we, and every day... Oh, we all need one. Every day, I, I think... It's a battle to to make that realization for me. I don't know if that has anything to offer about a lot of these things. <laughs> no, but I, I think it's great. Uh, and and to take the time out, I, I guess that that is kind of an issue. That well, I wanted to say something about reading a good book or reading a, yep. a book like this mm-hmm. that uh, has so much information on it, and we're reading less. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. That's, that's kind of that's problem. another podcast isn't that's it? that's a whole nother thing but but I, I I do think you you're on the right track where you you take a break you do some inventory on what you want where you're at what you're gonna do um, don't we all need to do that now, I'm not so sure everybody the, the Joe walking up and down the streets doing that I want to wave the flag out there and say hey stop and think reflect be introspective, think about the future, think about the past, figure out your next steps. And it's not about you. It's about how you can help other people. And as soon as we get everybody on that train, I think we're going to be better off. In full disclosure, though, anyway. uh, when I was working full time and uh, had uh, a lot of res- responsibilities on my plate, it was a lot more difficult. As an old retired professor, I actually have the time to do this, so I, I'm not advocating it necessarily as, uh, hey, I did it, and, you know, that kind of thing. No, so, no, but I think it, it does make sense, and I'm all yeah. about uh, folks taking time out to really think about what they want and how they're going to get it, what's stopping them from getting it. 
uh, making good decisions that not only affect themselves but f affecting others. So we try to do that in our counseling efforts, and I think it's something that we probably need to do as individuals. Uh, Tom, I've, I've enjoyed our discussion today. You know, this book is 500 pages. Uh, it's a big, thick book, lots of charts and graphs. And it is, uh, it, it's, uh, and I think I texted you at one time. I said, I'm trying in, in reading this. But, but um, there are different ways to read a book. You can get it in Audible, Audible so you can mm -hmm. kind of shout out to Audible, who we wish was a sponsor, um, so that people can listen to books now if you don't have time to sit down and read. But, but the idea of reading this book and taking time out to sort of compare what this uh, psychologist, cognitive psychologist, has offered, I think, has been uh, enlightening. Good thinker, good scientist, good writer, uh, great book. And my ultimate response would be, yeah, and it's got – there are more levels of complexity than even addressed in the book. So, uh, you know, somewhere out there is the truth, as the X-Files always put. Okay, I'm glad you got that X-Files reference in there. I, I will say this. I, I guess I, I dropped his name several times uh, during this conversation, but our, our dear friend Malcolm Gladwell, yeah. uh, we've got to go there. We've got to talk about him and what he's been doing. We'll talk more about uh, some of these uh, these psychologists and others mm -hmm. out there who are writing and uh, giving us uh, food for thought. So, Tom, it's been a pleasure. I hope you've had a good day today. Uh, I guess we can end right there, and I'll see you next time. So long, everybody. Mm -hmm.